Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Darcy, and in today's episode of the Science on the Edge podcast, I'm going to be discussing existential risk. So what is existential risk? Well, it's any, um, any technology or any threat that may risk the destruction of our species, of humanity, or even of the planet. Now, I'm not really going to be talking about um, the natural risk so much. So things like asteroid strikes, for example, or a supernova or anything like that. I'm not going to be talking about them. I'm going to be talking about the risks that um, humans are involved in generating. So things such as nuclear war, artificial intelligence, biotechnology and climate change. So I'm going to be discussing those at length. I'm going to be talking about what the risks truly are, whether we should be worried or it's all just scaremongering, and what we can do to mitigate some of those risks. We are not extinct yet. There's still potential to mitigate some of these threats. Now, this may sound like a bit of a depressing topic, but knowledge is power. So knowing about these risks allows you to do something about them, even if it's just um, sharing the message, spreading the message to other people, informing politicians, voting for the right people, the right campaigns, and changing your personal behavior. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so... Hmm. Away we go. Okay, so to introduce the topic, existential risks share common methodological challenges. How to arise and scan for and evaluate low probability, high impact events. How to encourage responsible innovation amongst technologists and a safety culture amongst scientists. But lessons can be learned across different risks. Now, this is a definition um, or a kind of goal relating to existential risk and its threats from the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge. There are several such centres that are growing in influence. So people are trying to address these existential risks, even if it seems like many of today's politicians really aren't. OK, so there's certain risk categories. Here are the major risks to life. One, nuclear war. Two, biotechnology. Three, artificial intelligence. And four, climate change. These are the major risks which I'm going to be discussing today. There are other risks, but the major risks fall into these general categories. Um, I should say that pandemics um, relate to this too. Um, pandemics such as more virulent forms of COVID-19 are as old as our species. But in today's interconnected world, we are more vulnerable than ever. The increase in the capability and spread of biotechnology and entry of humans into novel environments, forests, jungles, that kind of thing, poses new risks from accidental contact or exposure to a new pathogen such as has occurred with um, Ebola, for example, to intentional release or misuse of biological agents that are found within the environment or deliberately manufactured. Um, COVID-19, which um, at the time of recording we're in the midst of, is a pandemic that has killed um, millions worldwide. It's spreading and spreading. Um, now, it's really a dress rehearsal because COVID-19 is not so lethal. Its um, infection rate, or more, more its death rate, is relatively low, at least in the current strain. More strains that are more virulent may arise. But other diseases in the past have wiped out huge chunks of the population. For example, the bubonic plague in the Middle Ages is estimated to have killed about a third of Europeans, one out of every three people. Now the world is extremely interconnected now. A disease can travel around the world very quickly. Um, in previous centuries, certainly in previous millennia, there were isolated populations of humans in different parts of the globe. For example, there was no contact between the peoples in the Americas and the peoples in Europe. And this lack of contact meant that even if a really virulent strain of disease arose, 
First of all, it would take so much time to spread around the world that some sort of resistance would have built up. And second, there would be parts of the world that it could not reach. So wiping out the entire species or most of the species with some sort of pandemic was very difficult thousands of years ago. But now, because of, um, well, because of the development of the aeroplane for a start um, and all the traveling that people do, a pandemic can spread quickly. And COVID-19 isn't so severe, but sooner or later, a more severe pandemic will arise and could wipe us out or at least wipe out such a huge number of humans that civilization falls apart. This isn't some, some vague idea in some sci-fi movie. It is just a matter of time before, before such a thing occurs unless we put better, better protective measures in place which hopefully this COVID-19 pandemic is forcing governments to do. But I don't see as much evidence for that as I would like. Okay, so let's go through these major risks, nuclear war, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and climate change. Now, the first thing I'd like to talk about is nuclear. And uh, this, this particular existential risk is one that most people seem to have forgotten about. They kind of think, oh, the Cold War's over now. Nuclear threat is over as well. No, no. In fact, many experts believe that we are more at risk of nuclear war now in the unstable world that we live in than we were during the Cold War. At least during the Cold War, all the weapons were in the hands of two powers, two major powers. And we were watching each other and we had a stalemate. Yes, nuclear war almost happened many times, which I am going to discuss shortly but there was some semblance of control but since the end of the cold war um, and the rise of new nuclear powers um, there is the potential is the potential that some rogue state may start a nuclear war and it could just be accidental misinformation um, some crazy guy in charge of a country that does happen even in the west um, and nuclear war could begin. Now, when I was a child, the Cold War was still on. Um, a lot of younger people um, listening to this podcast will, will not really know this, but um, just a few couple of decades ago, we were on the brink of nuclear war. When I was brought up in the 1980s, um, the school that I went to, we were forced to watch documentaries at school about what would happen after a nuclear war. Documentaries where it showed people's legs being being um, sawn off and um, following a nuclear apocalypse. So the dropping of nuclear weapons in the UK um, without anesthetic, I should say. Babies being born in barns that have been blown away. Um, our cities turned to dust. People in our classroom actually fainted when we watched this because it was so realistic. Um, and it was so likely to happen. We were brought up under the shadow of a mushroom cloud, as um, the Queen song um, goes. What is it? Um, Here we are, tall and proud, beneath the shadow of a mushroom cloud. <laughs> um, Hammer to Fall, I believe the song was, uh, one of Queen's best. Um, but it was accurate. It was accurate. We did have a shadow of a mushroom cloud above us. Most of us um, had the idea that we might not make it to adulthood because nuclear war would begin. And the thing is, if nuclear war starts, it's not just one nuclear weapon that gets fired. When one nuclear weapon gets fired, there is retaliation, there is retaliation. Before you know it, in a very short period of time, thousands of nuclear weapons have been fired. And the world is basically, it's basically destroyed. Nuclear war was the first and is still one of the most likely existential risks to humanity. This man-made risk, you realize, could kill a huge percentage of humanity. Research into nuclear threats by scientists make it likely that the resulting nuclear winter following a thermonuclear war could be far deadlier than the actual war itself. The, the dust that would um, enter the stratosphere would block out the sun, the crops would fail, there would be mass starvation, billions would die. Not to mention the fact that at that point, all the cities have been turned to dust anyway. Society would fall apart. Civilization would be gone. Medicine would be gone. Economies would be gone. Most humans would become extinct within a very short period of time, even if they weren't 
directly killed by the nuclear weapons, as many would be. And perhaps the whole species would be wiped out. Nuclear is a real existential risk, a real existential risk. And you've got to understand that because there have been so many near misses already with nuclear war, and we've only had nuclear weapons for less than a century, it is only a matter of time if we don't change how we, how we manage our nuclear weapons or get rid of them. It's just a matter of time before nuclear war does happen. And it would be a catastrophe. This is not a threat that's gone away. Countries like North Korea becoming nuclear powers and the threat of Iran becoming a nuclear power and the instability of some of the major powers on this planet, the leaders seem to be threatening nuclear war on a relatively regular basis. This is worrying. So let's talk about some close calls. I'm going to spend sort of the next the next 10 minutes or so um, discussing some of the times when nuclear war nearly happened. Now, there are too many to talk about and to discuss in, in just 10 minutes, in fact, because um, nuclear war nearly happened so many times since uh, nuclear weapons were first developed. So I'm just going to talk about some of the major close calls. There are many more than I'm discussing. Okay, so first of all, uh, this is uh, in November the 5th, 1956, during the Suez Crisis. So the Suez Crisis was when Britain and France invaded Egypt to protect the Suez Canal. Um, and this was a very tense situation. A nuclear war almost accidentally happened. So while British and French forces attacked Egypt, the USSR warned they were considering non-nuclear attacks on London and Paris to bring a stop to the fighting. On the night of November the 5th, 1956, NORAD received alerts that unidentified aircraft were flying over Turkey. A hundred Soviet MiGs were flying over Syria. A British bomber had been brought down over Syria and a Soviet fleet was on the move in Turkey. Thinking these events were a Soviet offensive, the US worried a NATO nuclear strike against Russia could soon follow. It turns out each of these perceived attacks was actually swans flying over Turkey, an Air Force escort for the Syrian president, a bomber brought down due to mechanical issues, and scheduled routine exercises of the Soviet fleet. That information is not uncommon, uncommon and it's easy to misinterpret. It really is. Nuclear, weapon, nuclear war could happen accidentally just for, because of bad intelligence or faulty equipment. Um, October the 5th, 1960, a nuclear attack of the moon. Turns out the moon. A radar alert from Thul, Greenland was sent to NORAD announcing the detection of dozens of Soviet missiles launched for the United States. NORAD went to high alert, but leaders suspected something was amiss given that the Soviet leader was visiting New York during the supposed attack. It turns out the radar had misinterpreted a moonrise over Norway. Now, if the Soviet leader had not been visiting New York at the time, then the threat would, may have been perceived as a reality, and retaliation could have been made, and nuclear war could have been begun, and we probably wouldn't be alive right now. Uh, January 24th, 1961, H-bombs dropped on North Carolina. A bomber was flying over North Carolina when it lost a wing and two of its nuclear bombs fell to the ground in Goldsboro. One of the bombs broke on impact after its parachute failed. The other landed unarmed, but five of its six safety devices also failed. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara had this to say, and I quote, by the slightest margin of chance, literally the failure of two wires to cross, a nuclear explosion was averted. If this hydrogen bomb had detonated, could it have been misinterpreted as Soviet foul play and nuclear retaliation made? Quite possibly, quite possibly. 
This is August 23rd, 1962. US bomber in Soviet no-fly zone. During this era, US B-52 bombers armed with nuclear weapons were constantly in the air in an attempt to prevent the planes from being destroyed on the ground in a surprise attack by the Russians. The Russians had intercepted bases that were fought to have a 400 mile radius in order to prevent these plan planes from getting too close. On this particular day, the crew on one of the B-52s made a navigational error that took them 20 degrees off course and within 300 miles of one of these suspected interceptor bases. It's unclear why the Russians didn't react, but the US did eventually alter the course of that particular route to prevent another similar mistake. However, the correction didn't take effect until after the Cuban Missile Crisis had ended. The Russians could have taken this as a threat. They could have attacked. War, again, nearly happened. Okay, so this is again 1962, October 25th. A burr triggers nuclear alarm. The Cuban Missile Crisis was underway and US military forces had been put on high alert. A guard at the Duluth Sector Directional Center shot at what he thought was an intruder climbing the fence into the facility. He activated a sabotage alarm that sounded across all the bases in the area. However, at Volk Field in Wisconsin, the alarms had been miswired. Instead of signaling an intruder at another base, an alarm sounded that ordered takeoff of nuclear armed F-106A interceptors. Because they were on high alert, pilots knew this wasn't a drill. Fortunately, they first established communication with the Duluth Center, where they learned that this was not a nuclear attack, but rather a burr trying to enter the center. Imagine that, a burr climbing over a fence could have started nuclear war. Things are, things are that close. Accidents can happen, mistakes can be made. Okay, moving on, October 26th, 1962. I won't stay in the 60s. It's just that quite a few things happen in the 60s. An unannounced ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, launch during Cuban Missile Crisis. The Titan II ICBM was launched from Florida into the South Pacific, but no one alerted the Morristown radar site. The understandable concern at the radar site was eased once the crew was able to plot the course of the missile. But this event made clear just how great the potential for a false alarm was. Orders were given that radar warning sites must be notified in advance of test launches and the countdown be relayed to them. Another example of a false alarm. And there's been several, there have been several. Okay, um, so moving on again. Um, we're still in 1962. We're still around the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 27th. Soviet sub-captain decides to fire nuclear torpedo during the Cuban Missile Crisis. This may be the closest call of all. On October the 27th, 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, 11 U.S. Navy destroyers and the aircraft carrier USS Randolph had cornered the Soviet submarine B-59 near Cuba in international waters outside the U.S. quarantine area. What they didn't know was that the temperature on board had risen past 45 degrees C, 113 degrees Fahrenheit, as the submarine's batteries were running out and the air conditioning had stopped. On the verge of carbon dioxide poisoning, many crew members fainted. The crew had had no contact with Moscow for days and didn't know whether World War III had already begun. Then, the Americans started dropping small depth charges at them, which unbeknownst to the crew, they'd informed Moscow were merely meant to force them to the surface and leave. We thought that's it, the end, crew member VP Olov recalled. It felt like you were sitting in a metal barrel which somebody is constantly blasting with a sledgehammer. Now that captain, 
that Commander of had submarine could have fired the nuclear weapons. World War III would have begun. It was that close. It was that close. Okay, there's a few more I'd like to go through. I'm missing out several, I should say. There were so, so many. Um, okay, so this is in 1967, May 23rd. Confusing solar flares and nuclear attacks. The Air Force had a series of radar stations around the world that were supposed to provide early warning detection of a Soviet nuclear attack. On this night, many of these installations went dark and the military feared the Soviets had disabled their early warning system as the first stage of a nuclear attack. Nuclear bombers were prepared to take flight, but just in time, the recently established Solar Forecasting Center was able to get a bulletin into the hands of a commanding officer showing that a solar flare and not the Soviets had knocked out the radar systems. If your radar systems are knocked out, you assume you're being attacked. Nuclear war, again, narrowly averted. Okay, so 1973, October 24th, here's another, and I'm missing out several, by the way. False alarm during DEFCON 3. During the Arab-Israeli war, the US went to high alert as a way of warning the USSR not to intervene. However, while this was in effect, mechanics in the Kincholi Air Force Base in Michigan accidentally activated the whole base alarm system. Pilots and crew all ran out to their B-52 bombers ready to take off. When the duty officer realized it was a false alarm and called them all back before any further damage was done. If he hadn't realized it was a false alarm, again, away we go, nuclear war. Everyone is on a trigger, ready to fire, both the east and the west at this time. Nuclear war, narrowly averted. There's one I'm going to mention here, actually, very briefly, um, that isn't on my list. Um, this relates to presidential depression. Now, you've got to understand that in the US, the button, so to speak, the metaphorical button, um, is controlled by one man, the president. If he decides to launch a nuclear attack, that's it. It's just his word. It doesn't need to be verified. There's no committee. It's all down to the president. The president is just a person. People. People have issues. People can be depressed. People can be anxious. People can be psychopathic. We should not have all this power in the hands of one person. For example, August 1st, 1974, presidential depression. In his last weeks in office, during the Watergate crisis, President Richard M. Nixon was clinically depressed, emotionally unstable and drinking very heavily. U.S. Secretary of Defense James R. Schlesinger instructed the Joint Chiefs of Staff to read any emergency order coming from the president, such as a nuclear launch order, through him first. Of course, that's normally not the case. Normally, the president's word is final when it comes to nuclear attack. Um, people in the US military are trained just to respond immediately when the nuclear order is made. Nuclear war could have easily begun just because someone was depressed or drunk even, it's that simple. Okay, so 79, November 9th, simulated Soviet attack mistaken for a real attack, a genuine attack. Computers at NORAD headquarters indicated a large scale Soviet attack on the United States. NORAD relayed the information to the Strategic Air Command and other high-level command posts, and top leaders convened to assess the threat. Within minutes, US intercontinental ballistic missiles, IPMs, ICBMs, crews were put on highest alert. Nuclear bombers prepared for takeoff, and the National Emergency Command, um, Airborne Command Post, the plane designed to allow the US president to maintain control in case of an attack, took off but without President Jimmy Carter on board. After six minutes, satellite data had not confirmed the attack, leading officials to decide no immediate action was, was necessary. 
Investigations later discovered that the incident was caused by a technician who had mistakenly inserted a training tape containing a scenario for a large scale nuclear attack into an operational computer. In a comment about this incident in a later designated top secret, since declassified, senior US State Department advisor Marshall Shulman said that false alerts of this kind are not a rare occurrence. There is a complacency about handling them that disturbs me. False alerts, false alarms have happened a lot. And any one of them could, res could have resulted in nuclear war. Okay, I'm going to talk about a couple more before we move on. I know I'm, I'm giving you lots of examples here. I'm just trying to drive home the point that we have nearly had a nuclear cata um, catastrophe several times. Nuclear war has only been narrowly averted. So June the 3rd, 1980, to June the 6th, 1980. Faulty chip, faulty computer chip, signals a Soviet attack. Early in the morning of June the 3rd, the warning displays at command centers began showing varying numbers of missiles had been launched toward the United States. Preparation for nuclear retaliation immediately commenced. However, person however personnel were able to determine in time that this was a false alarm as the varying missile numbers weren't logical. Three days later, before the cause could be determined, the same thing happened again. And again, B-52 crews and missiles were nearly sent out in retaliation. A faulty chip in the computers was finally found to be the cause of the display problems at the command posts. Computer glitches happen. Computers are not perfect. A faulty computer, faulty display could signal a nuclear attack, and then there would be retaliation. And then the world goes bang. Really is that simple. Okay, I'm going to give a, a few more um, examples, not many more examples. I just want to bring things up to date. So here's 1983, September 26. The Soviet Union detects incoming missiles. The Soviet early warning satellite showed that the United States had launched five land-based missiles at the Soviet Union. The alert came at a time of high tension between the two countries, due in part to the US military buildup in the early 1980s and President Ronald Reagan's anti-Soviet rhetoric. In addition, earlier in the month, the Soviet Union shot down a Korean Airlines passenger plane that strained into its airspace killing almost 300 people. Stanislav Petrov, the Soviet officer on duty, had only minutes to decide whether or not the satellite data were a false alarm. Since the satellite was found to be operating properly, following procedures would have led him to report an incoming attack. He chose not to follow procedures though. Going partly on gut instinct and believing the United States was unlikely to fire only five missiles, he told his commanders that it was a false alarm before he knew that it actually was a false alarm. Later investigations revealed that reflection of the sun on the tops of clouds had fooled the satellite into thinking it was detecting missile launches. So Petrov lied to his commanders because he was worried that nuclear war would begin if he told the truth. So one man lying lying to his commanders, which most officers would not do, averted World War III. Now, actually, I've, um, I've, seen, uh, I've seen the daughter of Petrov. Um, so basically, I was attending a talk by Max Tegmark at um, University of Cambridge, and he was talking about existential risks and AI, amongst other things. And he had the daughter of Petrov with him, who, who spoke at length about her father and how he basically saved the world. He's obviously very proud of her father. But it was that close. It was that close. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about three more examples. Um, this, again, is from 83, November the 2nd. Soviets misinterpret. U.S. nuclear war games. 
NATO conducted a massive command post exercise simulating a period of conflict escalation November 2nd to the 11th, 1983. This culminated with a simulation of the highest military alert status, DEFCON 1, and a coordinated nuclear attack against the Soviet Union. The exercise was highly realistic and debuted a new, unique format of coded communication, radio silences, and the participation of heads of government. Unbeknownst to NATO, this triggered extreme alarm on the Soviet side, where analysts feared that it was a cover for an actual nuclear attack conveniently timed to coincide with the revolutionary holiday. Soviet nuclear missiles were placed on high alert and readied for launch. The climax came on the morning of November the 11th when the Soviets intercepted a NATO message saying that the US nuclear missiles had been launched against them. Robert Gates, then De Deputy Director of Intelligence of the CIA, later said, we may have been at the brink of nuclear war and not even known it. So many close calls, so many close calls. I'm just gonna give you two more examples now. I could give you a dozen more examples, but we'll stick to two. And then I will say what we can do about this, this threat of nuclear war. So March 18th, 2016 to June 15th, 2016. Drug use and nuclear security. 19 airmen from the 90th Missile Wing at F.E. Warren Air Base um, are under investigation. This was back in 2016. Under investigation for illegal drug use. The base operates 150 nuclear missiles and the airmen who are being charged were responsible for ensuring the security of the weapons. So people high on drugs responsible for maintaining the security of a nuclear arsenal. That should really make you think. Okay, I'm going to give the final, a final example now. Well, this isn't an example as such. This is several examples that we don't know about. So 20, um, June 20th, 2016, um, the annual probability of accidental nuclear war is poorly known, but it certainly isn't zero. John F. Kennedy estimated the probability of the Cuban Missile Crisis escalating to war between 33% and 50%, and near misses keep occurring regularly, probably more frequently than we are aware of. Although most of these incidents on our timeline were reported by US sources, there is no reason to believe that the opposing superpower had fewer incidents or that, or that there have been zero incidents in countries such as China, the UK, France, and Israel. We're all nuclear powers. The UK, my country, has nuclear weapons. You must make mistakes too. And on top, on top of the fact that um, any one of, um, of one of us countries could, um, the Western countries, could accidentally start a nuclear war, there's also Israel, India, Pakistan, and North Korea now. And new, other nuclear powers on the verge of arising, such as Iran. Although some argue that the superpowers should keep their current nuclear arsenals forever, Simple mathematics shows that nuclear deterrence isn't a viable long-term strategy unless the risk of accidental nuclear war can be reduced to zero. Even if the annual risk of global nuclear war is as low as 1%, 1%, and it may be higher than that, we'll probably have one within a century and almost certainly within a few hundred years. This future nuclear war would almost certainly take more lives than nuclear deterrence ever saved. That's enough examples. I should say, by the way, that these examples were provided by the Future of Life Institute. There are many more examples there. If you go to futureoflife.org, you can see them. Nuclear weapon almost, nuclear war almost happened several times. And right now we're in a dangerous situation because there are more nuclear powers. There are more nuclear powers out there. 
Um, so there is a worry. There is a worry that nuclear war could happen. It's not a threat that's gone away. It really has not. Both the West and the East have thousands of nuclear weapons. India and Pakistan have been on the verge of war for a very long time, and they're both nuclear powers. Plus, there are small states like North Korea, with arguably a crazy leader in charge. Saying that, some larger countries have arguably got crazy, crazy leaders in charge too, or at least ones that are very emotional and very prone to aggression. That's a dangerous situation for us to find ourselves in. So what can we do? How do we get back from the brink? Well, it's not that difficult, really, with the right consensus of opinion between the nuclear powers. First of all, we could renounce the option of using nuclear weapons first. If all the nuclear powers got together, signed treaties renouncing the option of using nuclear weapons first, then the fingers would move farther from the trigger. At the moment, no one has renounced that option. So we are all constantly watching, looking for the other side to flinch, even now that the Cold War is over. Ending the sole unchecked authority of any president to launch a nuclear attack. President of the USA, Premier of Russia, they have final say in any nuclear attack. They get to choose when to launch the weapons. We cannot always guarantee having a mentally stable leader in charge of our nations and therefore our nuclear arsenals. There should be more than one check before nuclear war happens. More than one person should be involved in any decision to launch a nuclear strike. Having one person in charge is crazy. Taking the US nuclear weapons off her trigger alert. They are on a her trigger alert, even now. If they were taken off the her trigger alert, perhaps other nuclear powers would do the same thing. Cancelling the plan to replace the entire nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons. The US is not, right now, reducing its number of nuclear weapons, and it's supposed to. The Nuclear Proliferation um, Treaty was made quite a while ago, and the idea was... New countries would not develop nuclear weapons on the proviso that the countries that currently have nuclear weapons would reduce the size of the arsenals. And they were for a while. When the Soviet Union broke apart, um, the Ukraine was left with thousands of nuclear weapons. They were decommissioned. In fact, a lot of the, um, the nuclear product was actually used in nuclear reactors to power cities. Um, and there was this move to reduce the nuclear arsenals. But under Donald Trump, there has now been a push to increase the number of nuclear weapons, to replace the old ones with brand new ones, newer weapons. That is dangerous because if America is going to do that, Russia is going to do the same thing. And all of those countries which were told that the number of nuclear weapons would be reduced, on the proviso that they didn't try and make their own nuclear weapons, well, of course they're going to create their own nuclear weapons. Countries like Iran and North Korea, you can't blame them for creating nuclear weapons because if you're a country with a nuclear weapon, you are treated differently than a country that doesn't have a nuclear weapon. People are not going to invade you. They're going to bring you to the negotiation table whenever you've got some problem because you're a nuclear power. Now, at the moment, there's just a few countries with nuclear weapons and other countries such as Iran, such as North Korea, who feel that they've been mistreated in some way, they're developing their own nuclear weapons so that they can get a seat at the big table. So we should, we should reduce our arsenals, de-escalate. The big countries de-escalate, the smaller ones will follow. Actively pursuing a verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to eliminate, eliminate the nuclear arsenals. You see, at the moment, we have thousands of weapons. America and Russia alone have thousands of nuclear weapons, enough to destroy the planet several times over. 
they don't need so many if the idea is is for that to just be in, to just be a threat that if you're attacked the um, attacker's country will be destroyed then you can do that with far less weapons than we currently have you need a tiny number compared with what we have there should be a reduction in all of our armories it's far more than are needed the more weapons you have the more likelihood there is of one of them accidentally being fired and then there will be retaliation and our cities and our civilization and possibly our entire species would be destroyed we should be lobbying our politicians to do something about nuclear especially the big countries like the us and russia okay so that's enough about nuclear war i hope i've um I've um, made you realize, if you didn't already, that nuclear war is still a very big threat. But it's not the only threat. There are many others. Biotechnology being one of them. Biotechnology is a much, much larger threat than many people believe. Um, and I know this. <laughs> my area is biotechnology in a way. That is, my PhD is in cellular pathology and molecular genetics. Biotechnology and genetics, including cloning, gene splicing, gene drives, and several other related advancements, could potentially save and improve millions of lives. These technologies could eliminate so many diseases, improve crop yields, feed the starving, extend longevity, get rid of pests. However, these technologies could, however, potentially lead to existential risks associated with things such as manufactured pandemics, a loss of genetic diversity in the environment, and perhaps yet unknown other threats. So let's delve into that. First of all, gene therapy. Gene therapy. Now, gene therapy is a medical technique which focuses on the utilization of the therapeutic delivery of DNA segments, so nucleic acids, into an individual's cells in order to treat a disease caused by a genetic mutation. We all carry a couple of faulty alleles in our genome. We have 25,000 genes, and we don't, have good, we don't all have good versions of all of them. There are faulty genes that we can carry, these faulty genes can be asymptomatic, but many faulty genes are responsible for many cases of Alzheimer's disease, of diabetes, of heart disease, of high blood pressure, of cancers. Many other diseases, even obvious ones such as cystic fibrosis. So faulty genes, our genomes are full of them. And many of our diseases, many of the even things such as depression and anxiety that we suffer from are linked to genetic defects, faulty alleles. Now, there wasn't much we could do about that for, for many decades. Gene therapy has been developed some decades ago, and it's been used for quite some time to engineer things such as bacteria to make uh, drugs such as insulin, for example. But engineering multicellular organisms such as humans has been impossible. Older gene therapy techniques were just not very accurate. They would place a gene in your genome, but it would be random where it was placed and um, a healthy gene could be broken as part of the process, causing diseases such as cancer. Um, but in recent years, and by the way, if you want to know more about gene therapy techniques, I have delivered a talk on gene therapy, which is one of my podcasts. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about it now. I recommend that podcast episode though. Um, of I would. <laughs> um, okay, so in the last few years, a technique called CRISPR-Cas9 has been developed. Um, an extremely powerful technique, and now gene therapy is accurate. We can use CRISPR-Cas9 to directly bind to a faulty gene in a specific part of our genome. We have 25,000 genes. We can direct this enzyme directly to the faulty gene where it can snip it out. And the gene can be replaced with a healthy gene, a healthy allele. Now, this is an amazing technology. And in the next few years, we're going to see a reduction in so many genetically inherited diseases. 
For example, many breast cancers are caused by, hereditary breast cancers, are caused by a faulty BRCA gene, which is a, DNA, which is a gene that makes a DNA repair enzyme. Um, and my family had been affected by that. My mother had breast cancer. My mother, my, my mother had breast cancer and died of it. My sister has had breast cancer recently. My grandmother died of breast cancer. Gene anal genetic analysis has been performed. They have a faulty BRCA gene. Just passing from generation to generation, causing cancer at a very young age, I should say. My sister developed cancer in her early 30s. My mother died of cancer at 44. My grandmother died of cancer at 50. Um, so this is a faulty gene. One that I've been tested for myself and luckily I don't carry. Um, admittedly, only 1% of breast cancers are in men, but I could have passed this faulty gene to my child. I no, can't do that because I don't carry it. Um, now, these genes could be edited out of the genome, these faulty genes, reducing the likelihood of cancers and many other diseases. And soon they will be. CRISPR-Cas9 will be used to improve longevity, reduce the likelihood of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, cancer, so many other diseases. Increasing longevity. CRISPR-Cas9 is a revolution. Still in its early stages of development, but in the next few years, we will see it enter the hospitals and clinics. Amazing. And I am completely for this. I am pro-gene therapy. The problem, however, is misuse of gene therapy. The thing is, we have sequenced 25,000 genes, but we don't know what they all do. And we don't know how, all the inter how, how, how they all interact with each other. And if we start modifying multiple genes in an individual, there could be consequences. There could be side effects. There could be, there could be new diseases that arise. And they may not arise straight away, maybe in a few generations. If you edit a genome, those edits could be passed if they get into the sperm and the eggs into the next generation. And we are basically genetically altering our entire species. We just don't know what the consequences of that are yet, not long term. We need to think about what we edit. We need to do more research. I'm still for gene therapy, but there are many potential risks, unknown risks. So we need to be careful. Then there are gene drives. A gene drive is a genetic engineering technique that facilitates the replication of a gene or group of genes throughout a population by altering the probability that a specific allele will be transmitted to offspring. They have been proposed as a method to provide an effective means of genetically modifying specific populations and even entire species. Gene drives can be used for adding, deleting, disrupting, or modifying genes throughout a population. And the important thing is these gene drives, they don't just alter a gene, they make it more likely that that gene or set of genes will be passed on to the next generation. Normally, if a gene is altered, there's a 50-50 chance that gene will be passed to the next generation because there's more than one parent. But gene drives, they are designed in such a way that they push that percentage past 50%. So the modified genes will accumulate in an entire species, eventually perhaps altering the entire species. Proposed applications for such gene drives include exterminating insects that carry pathogens, notably mosquitoes that transmit malaria, dengue, and Zika pathogens, controlling invasive species, <coughs> or eliminating herbicide or pesticide resistance. If such drives were used for criminal or terrorist purposes, however, or by rogue governments, or even by mentally disturbed individuals, then the consequences could be severe. Gene, gene drives could wipe out species, perhaps species that we rely on, such as strains of wheat, or such as um, cattle, that kind of thing. <coughs> resulting in famine. But also gene drives could be developed to alter the human genome over several generations. These gene drives could wipe us out. They could cause infertility, for example, even if they're not intended to. So gene drives are a bit of a risk. There's a good side to gene drives. 
They have been tried. They have been shown to be effective. But there's a negative side as well. And these gene drives are being tried right now to prevent mosquitoes, for example, from living long enough to pass on malaria. Huge potential of gene drives, but there are negative impacts too. And I should say, unlike nuclear, nuclear weapons, they are kind of, um, they are really in the hands of governments, not in, in the hands of individuals. It's very difficult for an individual to create a nuclear weapon. It takes a government, it takes thousands of scientists, it takes lots of money, it takes huge facilities. And this gets notice. However, um, things like gene drives, gene therapy, doesn't take all of that. I have a PhD in cytopathology and molecular genetics. I have all of the techniques to um, perform genetic engineering to create gene drives. All I would need is a small lab with relatively easy to obtain equipment and reagents. And there's a lot of people with PhDs just like mine. Gene drives, gene therapy, genetic engineering could be performed by anyone. That's very, very dangerous. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to discuss engineered viruses, engineered viruses. So, biowarfare, engineered viruses and engineered bacteria, just genetically engineered could be used in warfare or to target specific individuals even. as a new assassination technique. Or specific races, specific peoples. This technology is becoming easier by the year. Genetically engineered viruses and bacteria could be released by terrorists or by governments even, or just by a crazy guy with a bit of knowledge. And they could decimate our population. They could wipe us out, make us infertile, destroy our species. These are real threats. The technology is there right now. Now I'm going to discuss artificial intelligence, AI. I'm not going to discuss this at length because AI I have discussed in other in other podcasts. I've got an entire podcast, I've got two podcasts that talk about AI in fact. I advise you to listen to them if you want to know more. But the point is, um, AI has been around now for quite a few years. Computers have been around for um, over a century. Um, actually, the first mechanical calculating machine was built by French, a French mathematician called Blaise Pascal back in 1642. This was the first calculator. The first mechanical computer um, was designed by Charles Babbage and the programming was put together by Ada Lovelace. This is back um, in the 19th century. This was a mechanical computer with cogs and dials, no electricity. It wasn't really built at the time. Um, the difference engine is the name, by the way. But this, this machine has been built since and shown to work. We could have actually had an IT revolution in the 19th century if Charles Babbage's computer had been mass constructed, um, powered by steam. But we didn't. Um, it took uh, way into the 20th century before computing took off. Alan Turing um, is one of the people most responsible for this. Back in the 40s, he um, created Colossus, a computer um, that broke the Enigma code and possibly won the war. We could listen to Nazi transmissions, decode them. And they never even found out about this till the end of the war, created by this one genius, Alan Turing. In the 50s, Alan Turing um, introduced a test called the Turing test as a way of determining if a machine was intelligent or not. In 1955, artificial intelligence, the term was coined during a conference devoted to the topic. Progress then progressed. Um, for people watching my talk on YouTube, you can see a timeline. For people listening to me on an app such as Podcast Addict or iTunes, um, I'm just going to summarize some of the major events. Uh, for example, 1997, a computer called Deep Blue was built by IBM, cost 50-something million dollars, was the size of a tennis court, and it was used to play chess, and it beat Gary Kasparov 
arguably one of the best chess players ever to live. This, um, this computer, Deep Blue, um, was amazing at the time. No computer had ever beaten a grandmaster at chess. Since then, computer technology has doubled in power every 18 months. That's Moore's law. Now, any home computer can beat a grandmaster at chess. That's so much of technology has advanced. Um, if we go to 2016, AlphaGo beat um, a, the professional goal player, Lee Sedal, 4-1. Go is harder than chess, more complex than chess. It was thought that no computer could ever beat a Go player because it involves creativity. But AlphaGo did. AI just keeps developing. Just keeps on developing. Um, we now have apps. I have one on my phone called Ada. And Ada basically allows, using AI, the diagnosis of any symptoms that I present. AI is used um, on social media all the time to manipulate our behavior. It's used to buy and sell stocks and shares. We have facial, facial recognition software. We have voice recognition software, all involving AI. This technology is getting better and better. This is so worrying that, um, that Elon Musk, founder of PayPal and Tesla and other companies, he was so worried about AI, and he's given a number of talks on this, that he put together a conference in Puerto Rico and um, with the aid of Max Tegmark, where all the top AI, um, AI engineers and scientists were brought together to discuss the topic. And they were asked, when do you believe that we will have human level AI? Now, some said never. One said worrying about human level AI is like worrying about all the population on Mars. It'll happen one day, but it's so far in the future that there is no need to worry right now. Others said we'll have human level AI in a few years, but the average said about 20 years. So imagine that's true. In 20 years time, we get human level AI. Technology is going that way. That means AI that can do everything a human can do as well as a human. Can talk, can recognize faces, can react, can plan, do all of these things. Now, if this AI does it's told or understands its orders, then that's fine. But if it misinterprets our instructions, misinterprets them, or misunderstands them in some way, or if it develops some sort of free will or consciousness, which could happen, we don't know why we've got consciousness, so we may accidentally create it in AI. If any of this happens, the AI could become a threat to us. Many people say, oh, well, then you can just pull out the plug. Well, perhaps, but if this AI has copied itself to the internet, to the cloud, that becomes more dangerous. And what's even more worrying is Moore's law says that the power of computer systems doubles about every 18 months, which means about 18 months after we have human level AI, we have something twice as intelligent as a human, then four times then 8 times 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 518 times more intelligent than a human. Something that intelligent would be like a god compared with us. How could we hope to control it or to understand its motivations or its plans? And it could accidentally wipe us out without us even knowing we could be killed in our sleep by some virus that it creates. Who knows? We should worry about this. AI may be a few years away, at least human level AI, but it's not that many years away, the scientists believe. And when any of it arrives, it could be a threat. And no one seems to be preparing for that, or at least not enough people. It's not something politicians talk about. They should be. Plans should be made. We could mitigate the effects of AI if an international consensus is made as to who can build the AIs and under what conditions and what they can use them for. We need to think about this now or we could destroy ourselves. I do um, recommend listening to my AI lecture to find out a bit more about the existential threat of AI and what we can do to mitigate that threat.
Then there is climate change, not last but not least. The world is heating up. Most scientists believe that now. Some do not, but they are a minority. Some politicians don't believe it, but they tend to have leanings or associations with oil companies, energy companies, that kind of thing. The fact of the matter is that the vast majority of scientists believe that climate change is occurring and it is caused by humans. And we have a very small window to mitigate the effects. If we do not reduce our emissions, our carbon emissions into the atmosphere very, very quickly, then we could pass a point of no return where we were unable to prevent global warming. Human activity is placing more and more pressure on natural processes and on the environment. If we push the Earth's climate past certain tipping points, and we're pretty close to those, this might lead to sudden catastrophic ecosystem collapses or runaway catastrophic climate change with severe consequences for human society and for the environment. Ice caps could melt, um, cropland could turn into deserts, mass starvation, mass death, the fall of civilization. Climate change is an existential risk that we created and we can still do something about it. But unfortunately, the most important thing on this planet to our species is money is economic power and our economies get weaker we have less money if we do things properly if we stop pumping gases into our environment if we stop destroying our rainforests and we have many world leaders who are ignoring the climate emergency the u.s president donald trump took the u.s out of the paris um, climate agreement this was a bad idea, whether you're, whether you're a left-wing or right-wing, doesn't matter. Climate change isn't a left-wing issue or a right-wing issue. Politics should not matter. This affects left-wing people and right-wing people. We need to do something about the climate emergency. Some people are trying, not enough people, or our planet will burn. And our species will come to an end. So I'm going to summarize now a couple of points. Um, and I'll start with a little analogy. Now, it's not me that came up with this. It's a philosopher. I can't remember who it was, actually. Maybe one of you could tweet me the answer to this. But a philosopher some time ago came up with this idea. Technology is like a bag. It's like a bag. We don't know what's in the bag, the scientists. We don't know. We put our hand in the bag and we reach around and we, we just kind of try and grab something. We pull a ball out. It's a white ball. That's antibiotics. We've just invented antibiotics. We have saved millions of lives. We've extended longevity. Antibiotics, amazing. We put our hand in again, jiggle it around. We've invented the jet engine. We can now travel the world, become more connected, a white ball. Put our hand in again. Um, we've now developed um, we've now developed electrical power. We've now got the IT age as a result of that. We've got the internet. We keep pulling out white balls. That's great. Occasionally we pull out a grey ball. Nuclear power. Why is it grey? It's grey because it's good and bad. It's good because we can power cities with nuclear reactors. It's bad because we can make nuclear weapons. It's grey rather than black, perhaps, because even though it can be used to create nuclear weapons, you have to be a country to do that. So there's a certain amount of control that we have as a species over the release of that technology. What humanity has never done so far is to put our hand in that bag and pull out a black ball. And there may be a black ball in there. What is a black ball? Well, a black ball is any technology that when it's discovered results in the destruction of an entire species. In our case of humanity. Now that could happen. 
Imagine that nuclear power as a technology was a little different than it is. It takes a lot of technology to break a ha an atom apart or to fuse two atoms together. But what if it was easier? What if all it took to break an atom to cause nuclear fission was to take some lead and put it in a microwave, expose it to microwaves at a particular frequency and bang, a nuclear explosion. Sounds silly because we know that's not how it works, but it could have been. We didn't know until we discovered nuclear power. If that was the case, there would be no humanity anymore. Microwaves, easily built, easy to acquire. As soon as this discovery was made, or at least shortly afterwards, cities would start to go bang. As a random crazy person or a, a terrorist let off a nuclear weapon in every town and city. It'd be impossible to stop it. The species would be wiped out overnight. There may be black balls in that bag that could wipe out our species. We just don't know yet. And when we listen to the stars, do we hear other species? We've been looking for aliens for a long time. There's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. There are billions of galaxies. The universe has been around for almost 14 billion years. The chances of humanity be the only intelligent species to ever evolve is slim. But our radio telescopes are not picking up any other life. There may be reasons for that. Maybe it's hiding from us. Maybe it uses some technology that is so far beyond us that we cannot even detect the aliens. But you think we'd notice something. Or maybe life, intelligent life, is just so incredibly rare that there is, we're the, all, the only one in this part of the universe. Again, it seems unlikely, but it's possible. It is possible. Or maybe it's just that every intelligent species, when it evolves and gets to our point, sooner or later, puts its hand in the bag and pulls out a black ball and it's gone. And maybe we're about to do that. There are a lot of potential black balls out there. I've discussed some of them. Certainly grey balls. Biotechnology could be the black ball because it's so hard to control. Who knows? But it is not too late. Let's end on a positive note. It may not be too late. It's all about education. With the right education, with the right politicians, with the right laws, with the right powers to the correct international bodies, with a push to stop electing despots to our top positions in governments. We have the potential to rein all of this in, to control these technologies and to not destroy ourselves. It's not yet too late. There is a flower of hope. Okay, so thank you for listening or watching, depending whether you've been viewing this on YouTube or listening to me on a podcast app. Um, if you want to know more about me, you can follow me on Twitter at Mark of the D, at M-A-R-K-O-F-T-H-E capital D. So that is all for now. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to speaking to you all again very soon. Bye for now. Goodbye.